today on MH News, we're marketing music part eight. Intro's up. Welcome to MH News VLAMP, video, lighting, audio, music, and photography, everyone. I'm your host, Matt Haslam. This is part eight in our 11-part series on marketing music. If you have not seen the previous episodes in this series yet, please go back and watch those first before continuing, as we're going to build on information as we continue in this series. Step eight, set your own stage. There are two parts to setting your own stage. The first is where, and the second is how. Remember we mentioned church halls, gymnasiums, and theaters? Well, when you think about performing somewhere, you probably didn't think about these places. Truth is, for the first year after you pick up your guitar and learn, you might have to perform in a couple smaller venues just to get some experience. But if you want to be serious in the music world, sometimes setting your own stage at different types of places is necessary after that first year. Most churches are always open to a new form of a fundraiser. So if you approach a few churches, especially if you perform religious music, and ask them if you can host a fundraiser in their church hall and perform with your band, most would agree to the idea. To do this is fairly simple. After a venue agrees to a time and date, you sell tickets to your fans. And because you have the expense in bringing all your own gear, like lighting and sound, if the church doesn't let you use theirs, and because you should be paid for your professional services, you can take from 50 to 95% of the profits on those ticket sales, depending on how big of a crowd you can bring in. Typically, if you can bring a large crowd in, you can go up to 95%, but when you're just starting out, the usual is only 50% to you and 50% to the church. The venue, in this case the church, takes the remaining percentage to pay for electricity, other expenses, and of course their profit. The church, in turn, is able to sell baked goods and drinks at the event, which is 100% for their profit. You can also do the same thing in local gymnasiums in benefit for a local school or sports program, or theater to benefit a local charity. People love supporting local charities or sports teams. So when you advertise your event, all you have to do is say up front that a portion of the profits will benefit the charity from the ticket sales, and all food and drink sales are for the benefit of the charity or cause. Now, this is great because people who are on the fence about you or your music might still come to the show just because they support the cause. Not only will doing your own concerts go to show your audiences your full potential because you aren't limited on how big your staging can be or what music you can perform, but it will also show that you don't just work for free. Now, in the previous lesson, I mentioned to not do charity events, so let's make this clear. If a charity is doing an event and they ask you to perform at their event, you have to charge them. When you set your own stage, you are in charge of the entire event and are only utilizing the venue for a place to perform in, and therefore you don't have to charge them. This said, you are selling all the tickets for this show, so you're taking your 50 to 95% of the gross sales off tickets sold, and by doing so, you're getting paid. Remember, it has to be percentage based. Otherwise, it leaves people to speculate that if you don't hit a certain dollar amount to cover cost or what you think you're worth, none of their purchase price will go to the charity or the cause. In this scenario, you are in charge. If you do an event hosted by a charity, they are in charge and should therefore pay. Put simply, you need to know how much you're worth, and if they can't reach what you're worth, then they can't have you perform. This said, if you can't sell that many tickets, you are getting a percentage so the financial success of a show falls on you. This means you have to do a lot of advertising on your own, post in community calendars, and sell tickets on your website using squareup.com, which we spoke about in a previous episode. What I found really helpful was making a tour out of these shows, where we would do 10 shows in 10 weeks, all of which we were fully in charge of. That way we can do advertising for the whole tour rather than individual shows. This way our fans can see posters for the whole tour, read the list of cities we were coming to, and even go online to find on our website the show closest to them and book their tickets. 
This made advertising much more cost efficient, but again, this is something for later once you have some experience running one event at a time. The second part of setting your own stage is by building it in all its literal definition. Let me quickly ask you a question. Think about the last concert you went to. I mean a big A-list concert. Think about the music, the light show, the video screen backdrop, the fog, the crowd, the stage. What was your favorite part of the show? What was more important to you when you go to a concert, the audio quality or the visual quality? If you said you remember the visual aspect more than any particular song, excluding the fact that you might have a favorite song or any audio aspect, you are with most of America. If you said the audio aspect was more important to you than any visual aspect, you are with a far fewer percentage of the country. Don't believe me? There has been a list of notable universities and industry leading companies who have done research on this very topic, and their data proves the following. When it comes to a live performance, the most important thing to an audience member is the visual aspect. But why? We are not asking you what your favorite concert you ever saw was, because that could be very biased by the fact that you have a favorite artist. We're asking you what's more important to you when you go to any concert, the audio quality or the visual quality. You see, an audience member who goes to a concert most likely is already a fan, or at least enough of a fan, to have listened or have memorized an album already. So when they go to a concert, they are going to hear the same songs only live instead of on their iPod. This is because audio engineers are good at their jobs nowadays, and it's their job to make an album sound as live as possible. There are only two reasons why people still go to concerts nowadays. One is because they want to see their favorite artist in person. The second is the atmosphere, meaning the lighting show, the staging, and the crowd. When it comes to these large artists, why do you think they spend millions more on building custom stages and light shows and leave audio be as simple as possible? What I mean by this is that the audio is mixed by a live audio engineer live during the show, no matter how big or small the event. The stage has been planned out in 3D software and custom built, costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. The light show has been planned out and is programmed by offices full of designers with highly advanced 3D and DMX software for possibly months. Meanwhile, the audio doesn't have to be mixed until the night of the show, live. Artists wouldn't spend this much time and money on the visual aspect and not an equal amount on the audio if it wasn't so important to the audience member's perception of the show that the light show be better quality than the sound. So why is all this important to us, seeing that we're not A-list artists? Keeping aside for a second that we should try our best to model after these artists who have made it to the stages we want to be on, really why is this important to us? We have to recognize that as smaller artists, our job is to get new people who have never seen our show before to remember us enough that they go online and either buy our album or find out when we're performing next and come see us again. So what's going to make them remember us more? Making sure we sound pitch perfect and our audio sounds like an IMAX theater with surround sound? Or is it going to be the fact that we have a killer light show and projection? When you first start up as a musician and start performing, you have one very simple decision to make. Are you going to invest more in audio gear or are you going to invest more in lighting? To best explain this, let me take you back to 2005 when I was about to begin my first headlining tour later that year. We didn't have that much money to spend, and I had this same question before me. In order to best make my decision, I took a look around me to see what others were doing, and as it turns out, every other band or performer invested everything in their audio system. In fact, out of the hundreds of performers in my county, only one had any lights at all, but they left them on the entire show, so they turned them on before going on stage, and turn them off when the show is over. This means they don't turn off at the end of a song, and they don't strobe when there's a loud drum beat. Nothing. A handful of other performers had a halfway decent audio system with good engineers running them, but as for the hundreds of other performers, they either tried converting their old home stereo system to a live stage sound system, and it failed miserably, or they relied on the venue, who hardly ever has good audio gear. So I asked myself, how can I set myself apart from this oversaturation? And all I had to do was make the right decision for my performing career. 
I had to pick the same direction any of the results from the countless hours of research these universities and companies were telling me, and the same direction no one else even tried before. Visuals. The first thing I did was I hooked up a $20 Radio Shack microphone to a guitar amplifier, and my guitar to another amplifier. That was my first audio system. The rest of my budget went to lighting, which let us, in less than a year before my first tour began, have more lighting equipment than any other band or performer in the area, and I was still in grade school. That first year, the music was far from perfected, and the audio, let's face it, left much to be improved, but the shows were a major success with venues begging us to come back and audiences loving the show and becoming lifelong fans. Later on, we invested in quality audio gear, which allowed us to start providing equipment services to other bands. But year after year, most of my budget went to lighting and the other visuals. Nowadays, you can find moving head spotlights, lots of LED park hands, and audience lights, which we use to light up the audience when they start singing along, lining our trussing, and a professional sound system, along with years of vocal lessons making sure we sound good. But nothing compares to the special effects. Over the years, I made one very simple promise to my fans, which I believe is a promise we all should make as professionals to our audiences. That is, to give our fans the best show they will ever see in the area. In the years following that first headlining tour, some bands followed our lead, which I'll admit was kind of odd, seeing that I was a kid leading some veterans who just a year before thought I was too young to even be in the industry. But they invested in some small park hand spotlights, which they continue to just turn on before the show and leave on constantly with no effects. But in the determination to do our best, we added many special effects to our live shows over the years, all of which set us apart, made each of our shows more successful than the last, and certainly a better show than other bands who followed our lead. In 2006, we added a falling curtain to reveal the stage in the beginning of the show, and confetti guns to fire during the final song on a strong beat of the drum. The next year, we added moving stage pieces, which I would stand on and have them, by use of a powerful electric motor underneath the stage riser, move me from the stage area to a designated area out in the middle of the audience, bringing me closer to the people in the back of the gym. Come 2008, we added pyrotechnics, and by 2009, we added a rain machine, which would shower down around 50 gallons of water in a rain fashion on top of me standing on stage. I don't say this to mention my accomplishments, but to make you realize that by concentrating on the visual aspect of the show, we were able to have larger and larger budgets every year and build our fan base the same. When it comes to setting your own stage though, you have to keep in mind the reason why you're going after a much different venue than everyone else, and that is that you don't want to give yourself limitations. In a bar, you're typically limited to a stage area, if you're lucky, of four foot by four foot. If you go after places that have gymnasiums, suddenly you can have a staging area like ours in 2009, totaling 30 foot wide, 20 foot deep, and 30 foot high, with a separate control area in the back of 10 foot by 10 foot by 20 foot high. That, my friends, is how you set yourself apart. Be so big that you cannot physically fit in places that aren't willing to give you your fair wage. One important thing to remember when you're building your concert is your set. Over the years, we found two different ways to build an amazing set. The first is a physical set you bring with you everywhere you go, and the second is a digital one you create through projection. See, when you plan your stage or set, you should remember to keep your setup as simple as possible while keeping your possibilities as large as possible. How we do this for the best price is through projection. While a video projector is expensive for some of us, it is a far comparison from transporting large stage items with you, like a row of lockers to set a scene of a hallway in a school, or a dresser in a bed, just to make a bedroom on stage. Over the years, we used one simple projector to show countless set backdrops on a plain white backdrop behind us. For venues that didn't want us bringing our pyrotechnics inside, somehow most venues didn't like that idea very much, we added a video to the projection of fireworks going off. For venues that would rather their gym floor not be covered in water from the rain machine, we added a simple rainy backdrop video. You could use it for these simple purposes, or for showing pictures or stock videos playing in the backdrop, 
or you could record dancers performing to your song and play it as you dance along, making it look to the audience as if you have dancers, as we call PIP, or Projection Interaction Programming. You could also project live video feeds on side projector screens, as we started doing in 2007, to have fans in the back see the show just as if they were in the front. Again, I'm not saying you have to go out there and buy lots of lights or a projector your first year out, but if and when you decide to invest in equipment, try investing in the visuals more than the audio gear, and maybe some of these examples give you some ideas for your next show. Believe me, your audience and your wallet will thank you, because making your show more appealing to audiences is elevating your brand, which means you can charge more and look more professional to your venues. If you don't have the amazing crew and the budgets we did, which allowed us to build these things for our stage over the years, maybe try adding a palm tree and some beach chairs the next time you perform a concert with an island theme, or play some sounds of an ocean wave coming in through the sound system during your concert at a lower volume than the music to give the atmosphere that your audience is really there at the beach. The next time you do a Christmas event, bring a full-size Christmas tree with you and decorate the whole stage. Maybe add some tinsel to your trussing and keep it far enough away from your lights to not catch on fire. Try coming up with ideas for your show and ask your friends or collaborators for some ideas as well. Another great tip when you do live performances is to tell your audiences near the beginning of the show that you welcome them to take pictures and video of the show. Lots of performers don't want fans to take video or photos of the show, but you have to realize the reach of social media and welcome it in your show.